Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and today we're talking about canning basics. So I'm really glad that you have chosen to spend some time with me today. And canning is one of those things that happens every year, just like the holidays in winter. Um, you know, it is something that is part and parcel of being a homesteader and having jars upon jars somewhere in a storeroom filled with all those beautiful fruits and veggies that you've grown is actually quite beautiful and somewhat of a badge of honor if you are a homesteader. Um, and I mean, canning is something that is fairly recent to me. Um, in the last five years or so, I've been canning. I never knew what canning was. And just to put it into context for those of you that are listening in the US who've probably heard the term canning, although not all of you uh, have, in the UK, we don't talk about canning. I had no idea what it was because it's not in any of the recipe books that you buy for, you know, making jam. And I spent years canning produce and making pickles and chutneys and jam and jelly and sauce and a plethora of other things uh, with granddad and granny but we never canned anything. So I wanted to take the opportunity today to kind of help um, you guys understand what canning is and how it can help you on your homestead. So let's get stuck in. What is canning? Well, canning is the method of preserving food from spoiling and making it shelf stable. And it's done by sealing jars and sterilizing them with heat, essentially. Um, for those of you history buffs, canning was actually uh, invented by a guy called Nicholas Appert, who lived in France. And in 1809, he invented the method of preserving food for the French military. And his research was basically him tightly sealing bottles and jars and then heating them for different temperatures and for different periods of time. And that's ultimately what led to this method of preserving food. And a year later, so at 1810, a guy in England called Peter Durand, he invented and patented creating a tin coated iron can to use instead of bottles to supply the British military with canned food. And then these processes of preserving food made their way across uh, the pond there and came over to America. And America quickly became a world leader in both canning of food and also can production. No surprises there. And uh, it was actually two gentlemen here in the US in the late 19th century, uh, a gentleman called Samuel Prescott and another one called William Underwood. And they set canning on a scientific basis by doing loads of research which describe the specific times and temperatures to heat and sterilize canned foods. And it's on that research that we now base home food preservation and other methods of preserving food. So in a nutshell, canning is a way that you can take all your surplus fruit and veg and even meat and fish in some cases um, and you can preserve it with heat to sterilize them and they become shelf stable because what you're doing is you're heating that jar or bottle is you know, you're going to be pushing the air out of that jar, which is going to create a airtight seal or a hermetic seal. And it is going to help prevent spoilage of your food by, and you know, it's, it's my favorite thing to talk about, although not really, um, is microbes. So you're going to be helping to preserve your food from yeasts, molds, uh, fungus, although fun mold is fungus, um, and bacteria, and also enzyme activity. Um, so it's it's really versatile, and you know something that we do a lot of here in the US, um, but not so much in the UK. So there's two types of uh, tools for canning. Really, there is the water bath canner. 
and there is the pressure canner. Now the water bath canner is probably the most common and this works by uh, you pop your jars in there, you cover it with um, water so it's about an inch over the top of the lids and then you heat it till the water's boiling and then once that boiling begins you start timing it for a set amount of time and the time and the temperature is really important because the temperature needs to be high enough that it's going to kill off your bacteria it's going to stop those enzymes from working it's going to deactivate those it's going to kill off any uh, fungi molds and yeast cells and stuff right and the temperature um you know, will only ever get as high as water boiling in a water bath canner. And the length of time that you have to have your items in that water bath canner are dependent on a couple of things. So number one is the size of the jar and the volume that you're using in there. Um, because it takes time for that heat to transfer from the water outside of the canner to the very centre of that jar. So obviously the bigger jars that you have, the longer that you've got to have that in the canner. Also altitude plays a part because water boils at different times and you want to make sure that you sustain that heating and that boiling for a longer period of time to make sure that the, the heat's penetrated all the way through that food, heating it thoroughly and killed off all those uh, microbes that are kicking about in there well, microorganisms, not just microbes. Um, pressure canning works by um, basically creating pressure. And because of the pressure, you can actually heat higher than the temperature of water boiling. And because of that, pressure canning is used to preserve um, certain types of food that are not suitable for water bath canning and we'll talk about that in a minute um, but people get quite frightened of pressure canners because apparently the internet is full of stories and videos of things exploding um, you know I've had glass break in a pressure canner too um, but that was down to the the glass actually having a crack in it you know, not because the temperature got so high, it blew up like a rocket. Um, so people are kind of getting a bit more, um, you know, confident in using pressure canners now. There's a lot of good information out there. There's some great resources for people. Um, but ultimately, that's that's what a pressure canner does, is it helps you to heat um, up much higher than the boiling point of water, which um, in the UK is 100 degrees Celsius. And I always get the Fahrenheit conversion wrong. I think it's 212 Fahrenheit. Um, I will check. Point. Ah, here we go. Boiling point of water, according to Google, 212 Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius. <laughs> so pressure canning allows you to go higher than that. And depending on your altitude, um, that's where things might get a little bit complicated, um, you actually need to have your cans at a higher pressure um, to be able to heat all the way through and again just like with the water bath canning you need to have those cans and stuff in that vessel for a certain amount of time and the higher up in altitude you go the longer that that needs to be in the canner to ensure that the food is um, heated thoroughly all the way through and killed off those microorganisms so there's two types of equipment or canners that you will use depending on the type of foods that you want to preserve your water bath canners and your pressure canners okay and the other things that you need for canning uh, are some jars to put some of your lovely delicious produce in and also lids for them and you know i could do an entire episode on jars and lids for canning there's people that prefer one brand over another brand and all sorts of stuff so I'm not going to get too much into into canning jars um, I'll let you guys research those but th there's, there's two types of canning jars really you have wide mouth and you have 
um, regular mouth basically and that's how big the actual opening of the jar is so your regular mouth is typical for things like jams jellies you know things that are kind of liquid whereas your wide mouth are for things that you need to kind of fish out of there so you know things like pickled spears of cucumbers you know things that you might need to get a fork or you know even your hand in i guess um, it just makes it a little bit more convenient Canning jars come in a myriad of different sizes. You can get itty bitty teeny tiny jars for, that are like four ounces. Um, eight ounces is pretty typical for your jams and jellies and uh, conserves, those kind of things. Uh, they're also known as half pint jars here in the US. And you have your pint jars, uh, which are pretty universal. You know, they're pretty straightforward to use and they're a good size for you know if you're trying to um portion control stuff for meals you know a pint is pretty um pretty handy and then you have quart size jars which are much bigger again and they're kind of like a double the quantity um, but again the size of jar that you're using for is usually indicated in a recipe and the smaller the jar obviously the more of them you can fit into a canner there are some canners which are um, taller so you can have two basically rows or two levels of cans that you're producing so there's a, a particular brand here in the US called the All-American Canner and that you can get two layers in there it's a pressure canner though um, but I mean it takes the same amount of effort to do you know five or seven jars as it does to do you know 10 or 14 depending on how many you can get in there so if you're looking at a can of see how many jars you can fit into it before you purchase it and you know there's no point in getting a can of that you know you can only do a couple of jars in at a time um, because that's just kind of a waste of your time and also the energy it's going to take to you know heat up the water and everything else in there so when I like to can I like to can a lot in one go um, just because if I'm gonna heat up the house to like 100 degrees with all the cooking and it's 100 degrees outside I'm gonna make sure that it it's well worth the effort. So that's a bit about um, canners and jars. Let's get into the types of food that you can do in each of them. So water bath canning is only for um, acidic foods, okay? So these are things that are like fruits, but not bananas and melons, although I guess if you can those, those would be super mushy and kind of gross. Um, but things that are naturally acidic and have naturally acidic kind of fruits in them. Um, so typically like your fruit jellies, fruit jams, um, those are okay to go in a water bath canner. Also things like chutney um, or pickles where you're adding vinegar to them and uh, tomatoes if you've added the acid to them. Um, any preserves that are made from fruits, uh, pie fillings, like fruit pie fillings, okay, let's, let's be very clear about that, not meat pie fillings, so like when we talk about pie in the US, it's typically fruit pie, not meat pie, like, you know, us northerners from the UK think of. So hopefully that makes sense, water bath canning, fruits and acidified items. Your pressure canner, is for those low acid uh, items. And we're talking things like, you know, um, green beans is a typical example, or asparagus. Um, some of the good examples are things like um, carrots and turkey or soup or stock. Um, or I guess bone broth, um, rabbit or chicken, beef, um, turkey, lamb, fish, all that good stuff, pork, uh, but not bacon. Bacon cannot be pressure canned at home and that's because of the amount of fat that's in there. Um, so just to be aware, there are things that you cannot 
pressure can at home like you might be able to see it sat there on the shelf in the grocery store in the supermarket um, but the commercial canning process is at much higher pressures much higher temperatures you know it is it is definitely a science and a big production facility that they do that in it cannot be done at home and i don't want anybody to kind of you know try doing those kind of things um at home because you can end up with some form of food poisoning so um let's just talk about actually things that you can't um can at home and uh, those include eggs like pickled eggs they can end up with some uh, rather nasty microbes in there um, you don't want mashed potato or like very thick pureed vegetables so things like um, pumpkin pie filling is a good example um, you can you can can you can 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 um, you can you can can um, winter squash but it has to be done in cubes and there's some good recipes and we'll talk about resources um, a little bit later um, but you can't do it as like a mushed up puree and the reason why you can't do it as a mushed up puree especially like your mashed potatoes is because that heat can't penetrate through it right I don't know if you've ever tried microwaving a plate of mashed potatoes and it's been cold in the middle and like super hot on the outside the same thing can happen in your pressure canner even though the temperature is really high it is the heat is not penetrating through that super dense potatoey mass or pumpkin uh you know pie or pumpkin butter um pureed stuff it can't get through there and because it can't get through there you cannot kill off the microorganisms so there is a risk that the food is going to spoil and go bad um, so it's just not worth the risk like don't don't muck about with um canning foods and we'll we'll get to that bit as well so uh no to eggs no to mashed potatoes and no to pumpkin butter and pumpkin pie filling um don't and, and because of the same issue with it not kind of working uh the heat working its way through to be able to appropriately sterilize your food um you don't want to be using thickeners like flour um cornstarch tapioca arrowroot or anything like that when you're using um like if you're making soups or stews you can add your thickener when you're cooking it to serve it but don't do it when you're going to can it there are like some approved canning thickeners um available and they're mostly like clear gel um gelatine and pectins those kind of things um so just make sure that you do you do do diligence and don't use an unapproved uh, thickening agent. Uh, don't try and can dry beans by just sticking the dry beans in there and some water and calling that good and hoping that it's going to uh, can properly you still need to soak them sorry but that's that's the cold hard truth you need to uh, soak your dry beans um you also don't want to do things like pasta um rice or noodles because again um the heat can't always get through those and um you need to make sure that they're heated all the way through and um, the other reason why you might not want to do it is because the texture changes in some of these foods after they have been um pressure canned and the fact that these can't be pressure canned also means that they can't be water bath canned too um and dairy is a good example of where like the texture will change and kind of be kind of disgusting so you don't want to do um that you don't want to do um you can't home can 
um, things with a large amount of fat in it. So that's why we can't do bacon. We can't uh, can butter. We can't can lard. Um, but also, you know, you can't can pesto. Okay. And um, if you're making pesto at home, the best thing you can do is to uh, freeze it into like little um, plastic uh, tubs. Um, you can't can it at home, unfortunately. It can only be done um, at a commercial facility. So just, just to be aware of those things. Okay, so there are only two safe ways of processing food at home in terms of canning, right? There's the water bath canning method for your acidic foods and your pressure canning method for various low acid foods, meat, poultry and seafood, okay? And we've got to talk a little bit about a delightful microorganism called Clostridium botulinium and it causes botulism. And this is the main reason why pressure canning is necessary, right? Because the bacterial cells are killed at boiling temperatures. They can form spores which grow well in these low acid foods and they're all in all sorts of different things okay before you get kind of freaking out about it like bacteria is on you know everything okay same with yeast same with mold same with fungus okay they're on everything and bacteria even form part of us but there are some bacteria which can cause toxins um, which are poisonous to us as humans and can make us very, very sick. And this is why it's really important when it comes to canning that we're using approved methods. We're going to reliable sources of um, information and we take the time to be careful um, in our prepping of our vegetables and fruits and meats and fish and stuff for canning. We're following the recipe and we're practicing some good, um, you know, basic kitchen hygiene. Um, so back to these uh, spores that happen. So um, the bacteria throws out these spores and spores are kind of like... I guess they're kind of like armoured up little uh, microbes, probably a good way to describe them. So spores tend to be activated and they can be activated depending on temperature, pH, various things. And it, it, what happens is these little like armoured bio suits kind of open up. Uh, when the conditions are going to be favourable for that uh, bacteria or microbe to grow. So the spores grow really well in these low acid foods and they grow exceptionally well in the absence of air. And that's exactly the type of environment that low acid foods like meats or vegetables are in after we process them. Because part of the canning process is that as things are all boiling, it creates gases, right? And steam's produced in there and it's pushing the air out and an anaerobic environment is an, an environment without air. So these little spores begin to grow and they produce um, deadly toxins, basically. Um, so it is really important that we use the appropriate canning methods to destroy these spores. And it is by pressure cooking and canning that food at a temperature of 240 Fahrenheit, or 116 degrees Celsius that can actually take care of those spores. And by take care, I mean dole out the harshness. It kills them off. So botulism contaminated foods. It's worthwhile noting that you can't see it, you can't smell it, or you can't taste the toxin. But a small amount of the toxin can be deadly. OK, so there's plenty of information that's out there. If you're here in the US, the CDC has got a whole plethora of information about botulism and the risks. And they've got lots of information and safe home canning instructions um, that they did with the USDA. And you know, there's some really good information in there. And even after you've canned your foods, 
it's you know you should be um checking on them periodically anyway and if you see anything that's like swollen up looks funny kind of looks like it's bubbling anything like that if in doubt chuck it out don't don't even bother opening it or you know seeing if you can rescue it if if you're not sure about it don't eat it and you know there's there's plenty of you know safe um canning recipes that you can try and there's a lot of good information that's that's available now so i don't want you to be scared about home canning and freaking out about it i just want people to be safe and know this is some sources of where the information is available uh, also be aware if you open your canned food and it like squirts liquid or foams at you or if the food is discolored or moldy or just smells bad like throw it out there are all signs of contamination um don't don't eat it um and you know always practice like some really good hygiene in the kitchen so you know use some bleach solutions to clean up the area where you're going to be uh, cooking and prepping for your canning activities make sure you sanitize your jars um, there's a few ways that you can sanitize your jars you can use a uh, contact sanitizer like the sort of stuff that you use if you're home brewing you can uh, boil your jars if you have sterilization uh, facilities um, like some dishwashers have a sterilization cycle you could use those um, i like to sterilize mine in the dishwasher and then i also use my sanitizing solution from home brewing as well um, just to be safe i mean i i work in a lab right i've seen some things and it freaks me out so <laughs> I, I like to be extra safe and i i know some people say that you don't have to sanitize the lids i sanitize the lids i pop them into a um a small saucepan with water i heat them up to boiling and i also spritz them with some of the um, sterilizing solution that i use for brewing as well just a quick note about electric or multi cooking appliances so things like instapots or um pressure cookers a pressure cooker is not the same as a pressure canner um so you should be looking for a pressure canner not a pressure cooker and um these electric appliances that uh, they've not been um tested um from uh you know a home canning perspective and you know they they're not approved to be used for those things so the only approved methods pressure canner and a water bath canner if i haven't said that enough already i really want to hammer that home and in addition to um, all the stuff that i've said previously if you're like me and you live at an altitude um, there are certain timings that we need to think about so where i live i have to add an additional 15 minutes onto my processing time and it varies depending on the altitude that you are at and i also have to ensure that when i'm pressure canning that i'm canning at 15 psi not at the uh, psi or the pressure uh, pounds per square inch um, recommendation for the recipe i i know that that seems like quite a lot to take in especially on a podcast um, but there are some great resources so let's get into some of those my number one resource is the Bowl Complete Guide to Home Preserving Recipe Book. And that has a huge amount of information in it. It includes average altitudes of various cities throughout the US. It's got tables for how long you need to adjust your temperature and your pressure for. That thing is amazing. 
and is so helpful it's got loads of recipes and things in it as well and it has kind of some troubleshooting um, guidance in there as well so super useful my next super useful resource is actually part of the university of georgia and it is the national center for home food preservation and i will put the link for this online they have got so much information and not just about canning but methods to preserve different vegetables so for example they've got a search function that you can find and let's just go ahead and search for let's try beets see what beets comes up with and it tells you how to safely can and um, preserve beets. There's, I mean, there's ways to freeze it. There's different recipes for them, how to take care of them um, in terms of cooking, not in terms of growing, but kind of the, the types, like the sizes and stuff that are needed, how to pack it um, into the jar, all that good stuff. There's loads of information there. There's also information about how to use a pressure canner and you know the designs and stuff that you need to take a, a look at so there's loads of information there and the great thing is that that is all free this website also has the USDA complete guide to home canning 2015 edition and again you can you know it's all pdf and stuff so you can readily get hold of it you can download it to your computer print it out later it's it's all there and those are my main go-tos for kind of technical information for canning um i've got a bunch of other recipe books and things as well but for the basics those two are the primary places where i go for information now the fun of course doesn't just stop there when it comes to canning there's various other utensils and stuff that you can get that help make things a little bit easier so you can get these fancy jar lifters so you can basically get the hot jars out of the the water um, there's funnels that help you pouring stuff in there and packing the jars um, there's like these magnetized like sticks or wands that you can pull the lids out of the hot water after you've sterilized them and pop them onto a you know a clean jar um, you know it's always good to have um, on hand plenty of clean cloths or paper towels as well um, and a little bit of um, vinegar because once you've filled your jars you want to wipe that rim clear of any bits of food or liquid because um, they can stop the seals forming properly on the jars and then all that hard work that you've done just kind of either escapes into the water or the lid doesn't seal and anything that doesn't seal we don't really want to be uh, storing in the uh, on the shelf we want to probably pop that in the fridge and maybe use it quite quickly uh, or toss it if you're um, you know not too sure and by toss it I mean throw it in the garbage not anything else um, also want to make sure that you've got um, some narrow flat rubber spatulas or some knives kind of kicking about like blunt ones because um, they're really useful for getting rid of trapped air bubbles uh, before sealing the jars and we want to try and get some of those trapped bubbles out of your jar because uh, those can um, have issues when it comes to sealing and heat and distribution and lastly i want to talk about headspace and it is really important um, when you're going through and starting to create your um, recipe and following the guidelines in the book and you're filling your jars always 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 be wary of the amount of headspace that the recipe calls for and headspace is basically the amount of air uh, or space that is left between the uh, top level of the food that's in the jar and the where the lid is going to be and, and the open mouth of the the jar and you need to make sure there's appropriate headspace in there because if there's 
too little, you run the risk of when all that food starts heating up and bubbling and boiling, it's going to push that lid off and it's going to escape out of that jar. Um, or worse, it could cause the jar to actually rupture under pressure if it can't get um, the, the gas that's generated out of there. Um, if you've got too much headspace, then... Uh, you can run the risk of, um, you know, there being too much air in that jar and it's not able to clear all that oxygen and air out of that jar. So it's not going to uh, sterilize it properly. And you can see some things happening like um, discoloration of the food um, because it's not been um, sterilized properly. So always pay attention to the amount of headspace. You can get like these little plastic headspace gauges that you basically put on the edge of your jar on the inside and uh, where the bottom touches the food, that's how much headspace that you've got on there. So there are some great tools that are available to kind of help you, um, you know, take a lot of the guesswork out of canning. And if you are concerned about canning and you know a little bit worried about you know some of the technical aspects of it um take a look at some of those resources and you know follow a recipe that you quite like the sound of and follow it step by step and following these things step by step means that you know really there's not a lot that can go wrong as long as you take good care um, to keep things clean and you know make sure that you cut away any kind of bad bits of you know the fruit or vegetable you know you don't want anything that's overly bruised you definitely don't want anything that's moldy in there um you know make sure that you cut those bits out and that you thoroughly wash the fruits and vegetables and stuff that you're going to be canning then you are setting yourself up for some great success. Again, you know, there's lots of information available and I wholeheartedly recommend both the Bowl uh, Complete Book of Canning and the National Center for Home Food Preservation as being some great resources. They've got some great tutorials um, in there. And just follow the recipe step by step. Like that's that's my biggest thing for somebody that's new to canning is uh, follow the recipe. Don't deviate from the recipe until you really get the the kind of hang of what you're doing, and then you can try, you know, adjusting. Um, you know some of the maybe the herbs or the spices that you you want to use. And um, there's plenty of different. Um, recipes that are available but you know it's always good to start with you know something that's tried and true and make sure that you follow those processing guidelines so making sure that you get the right pressure and timing that you are going to be canning for and for water bath canning that you're canning it for the right amount of time and just a point about um, water bath canning is that the timer starts when that water is back to boiling don't start it when you put the cans in there it's got to come back up to boiling and with pressure canning too it's only after that that vessel or uh, the um, pressure canner has vented for the right amount of time then you put the the pressure on to there if you're using a weighted one um, and you start the timer once it's got to the appropriate pressure okay don't start timing it when you've put it in there and you know you've got steam coming all out of the vent pipe uh -uh. it is when the pressure is correct and if that pressure drops off or anything that clock starts all over again because it's not at the right pressure for you to be uh, saying that it's been uh, canned appropriately okay so now I've probably terrified the life out of you about home canning why would you want to can well the number one reason is the fact that you can make things shelf stable and being able to free up room in the freezer is always great because inevitably my freezer's full and I can't fit anything else in there but 
Canning also like introduces you to unique flavors that you might not have um, had before, and you know relishes and pickles and stuff like that. They can really you know change a meal that you've had day in and day out into something truly amazing and special. And that's one of the things that I certainly love about uh, canning stuff. And also, there's something just so wonderful about being able to eat that produce that you harvested with your own hands back in you know summer and you're able to enjoy it all over again certainly with things like fruit pie fillings um we do this great dirty pear sauce uh, that might have um a liberal amount of rum in it um but you know that just kind of takes something kind of boring to something super amazing i mean dirty pear sauce and some vanilla ice cream yes please um but you know having you know your own homemade peach cobbler from peaches that you harvested from the tree and it's you know six feet of snow outside it just it's just kind of living a bit more seasonally and being a bit more in tune with where your food comes from and how it was grown. So that's it for this episode. I know I kept you for quite some time and I just want to say thank you and I appreciate you spending so much time with me in your busy schedule. If you want to know more about growing and preserving your own food, then I'm going to pop a link in the show notes so you can register your interest for the upcoming Grow Your Own Food Academy, where I'm going to be walking you through step by step how to grow your own food and preserve it with videos and you can learn how to grow food in your own backyard. Until next time, I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and I hope that you have a wonderful week and that your garden grows beautifully.